Good morning, everyone. I found a present up on the podium. Is, is this for me for real? It doesn't move now, though. This is truly a blessing, folks. This is way better than the cards that were there for before. Thank you for this. As we uh, approach the annual meeting this year, and by the way, this is annual meeting Sunday. Uh, one time a year we do this. We stop and look over the business of the church following the church service, and then we, on Sunday morning, we deviate from the typical scripture study and talk about some practical things just about developing, growing, and strengthening our church. But as we approach the annual meeting um, every year, I should say, as I do that, one of my practices is to carefully look over everything that we talked about last year. And I look at the goals that we set, and I look at how much progress we made towards those goals. And from that information, I'm able to develop ideas for the coming year. For example, in last year's business meeting following the service, we talked about a budget deficit and our need to balance the budget deficit. And over the course of this year, we took decisive action to address the problem. And so following the service, when we're upstairs talking, I'll be able to report some very measurable progress that we've made in this department. We didn't completely fix the problem, but we came pretty close to balancing things. And with this in mind, the plans that we lay out in this year's business meeting upstairs will reflect that information. And I'm sharing this with you to say that we're going to do the same thing the mor this morning in here. Um, we're going to reflect upon what we talked about last year, and we'll look at the progress that we've made over the course of the year, and then this year we'll plan accordingly. We'll talk about that and kind of lean into it. So let's dig in. Uh, last year in the morning service, we emphasized the importance of simply inviting people to church. Uh, and I think this is something that all of us could be doing more of. I, it, it, we could pr really never be doing enough of this, just inviting people to come and to join us. Uh, we can't bring people here. We can't impact them. We can't enhance their lives with God's truth in the fullest way that we want them to if we don't invite them to join us once in a while. And so at last year's annual meeting, we encouraged people to lean in and to work on spreading the word a bit more. We did this by talking about the very real qualities that our little church has. And the idea was that we have to be confident that there's something here for people in order to invite them. And we also did this by clarifying our vision, which is to enhance lives with God's truth. And the idea there was that we have to be clear about what we're doing in order to invite people to join us. And we also did this by lighting up the on-ramp a bit, and we announced some website updates and some business cards and a, and a strategy to use online videos as an incremental step towards coming in person and such things as that. And the idea was that we can't expect people to accept the invitation to come without a realistic means to respond to it. And now looking back over the year, we can point to some relatively small gains. So we are uh, much more positive in our outlook as a church. Uh, our engagement with our vision is growing within the body. Our website is sharper. I can report some instances of people accepting our invitation to follow us digitally and such things as that. But by and large, um, the efforts we've initiated last year have not yet translated into some of the numerical growth that I know some of us are hoping for. Uh, our church is still as small as it was. And what does that mean? All it simply means is that we have more work to do. Uh, it just means that we have to maintain what we've begun and build upon it. Uh, we need to keep inviting people to church, and we need to keep at this until we get it. It's a good thing, and it's something to be leaning into. And we're going to lean into this today by putting ourselves in the shoes of the people that we're inviting. And here's what I mean. Last year, the questions we considered pertain to how our own mindsets affect inviting people to come to church. For instance, we considered the question, why don't we invite people to come? What's keeping us from getting out there and inviting people to do that? What's keeping us from going for it? And we responded to this question with ways to feel more confident about our church. We also considered the question, why should we invite people? What's a God-honoring motivation to do so? And we responded by clarifying our vision, which is to enhance lives of God's truth. And these are questions that pertain to our own mindsets, the way we think. These are questions about how we think. This time around, we're going to consider how the people we're inviting might be thinking, how they might be thinking, because this also has a big effect upon how we go about inviting people to church. And so with that said, 
Here's the questions I want to consider for the remainder of our time this morning. Um, there are normally outlines up there. There are not this morning, so I'm just going to put the questions up on the board for you to follow along with. It's a very simple outline, but the questions I want to briefly consider this morning with you are, why do people go to church in the first place? How do they select a church to visit? And what prompts them to return week after week? Again, why do people go in the first place? How do they select a church to visit? And what prompts them to return week after week? And hopefully, what we glean from this will help us to grow in both uh, inviting and retaining the people that we invite. So here we go. Why do people go to church in the first place? Why do they do it? Um, when a person decides to integrate into church in a more purposeful way, what are they hoping to gain from it? That's the question here. I would suggest in general, there are three very basic things that are on people's mind that they are seeking when they say, you know, hey, I think I'm going to go to church, okay? Three basic things. First, to grow in faith. Grow in faith. They seek to grow in faith. They want to learn more about God. And despite what some in the church may suggest, people don't come to church to be entertained. I don't believe they do at all. Uh, there are so many incredible options for entertainment out there in the world, one of the last places they would look to be entertained is here. There's wonderful options for them out there. Most of the time, almost all the time, people come to church genuinely with a desire to receive God's truth. And we fail them every time we attempt to give them anything other than that. They're coming here to hear God's word. And when we don't give them God's word, we are failing them. That's what they're here for. They're here to grow in their faith. They're here to hear the word of God. Secondly, they're here to make Christian friends, all right? People are seeking Christian friendships. They seek to form Christian community, and they seek this for their whole family, for their children if they have them, for their loved ones. This is a good thing. This is a noble thing. This is a God-honoring thing. This helps us in our own spiritual walk. This is a huge motivator for attending church, perhaps even more so than the first one sometimes. And you really can't achieve this goal over a live stream. You have to be here for this one. And this is why this is a big motivator for people to walk through the door and to be part of a church. Another one, the last one. People come to church to seek to know how to live better lives. Again, people want to be better. This is good. This is noble. This is normal. They want to be more spiritually productive. They want to be more content with their life and their circumstances. They want to experience some joy, and they want to experience some happiness. These are all good things that people are, should, are normal to think, and they are normal to desire. And people start thinking of going to church because some circumstance in their life, some hardship, some loss, some form of anxiety, something, has caused them to start, to, to start seeking spiritual things, to start thinking that way to gravitate towards God and his word, towards community, and towards betterment, and all of those things. And with this in mind, a huge part of inviting people to our church is basically engaging with those around us and listen, listening carefully to them for when they begin to start spiritually seeking. Not everyone is spiritually, speak, spiritually seeking. Uh, a lot of people are grinding along and just doing their thing, but something will come along in their life that will cause them to look up and to think that way. And if we are present and we are there at that moment in their lives to be able to give them an invitation, it's a very, very powerful thing. Uh, I cannot overestimate the power of being present and available when a person is spiritually seeking. Uh, think of Acts chapter 8 with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Guess familiar with that account? You've got a man and, uh, who, who is seeking God, and he went to Jerusalem, and he came back with a copy of the Word of God, and he was reading from the prophet Isaiah, and he was trying to understand and, and seek what was going on there, and right in the moment that he was seeking, guess what? Philip showed up. Philip showed up, and, he, and God used Philip to bring the answers. He, Philip was basically a messenger, a catalyst for God to be able to bring those answers into his life. And the powerful thing there is that Philip was present and available at the moment that the eunuch was seeking. It's a very powerful thing. And in the same way, it is incredibly powerful, powerful for us when we are out there engaging people and spiritually present when they are seeking. I can remember in my own life, when I was in the army, I was around 19 years old, I entered a season where I began to 
spiritually search. I wasn't walking with the Lord and I began to really seek and began to really question and to began to really feel drawn towards God, but I didn't know where to go and what to do. I didn't have a first step to take or anything. I was just quietly in my heart beginning to pray and to seek God and just, I was ready to move, but I didn't know where to go. And in that time, right in that season, it wasn't very long I can, I can, after that started, that I got up one morning, it was a Saturday morning, and I went into Main Post. I was, on, I was stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky at the time, um, and I walked, I didn't have a car back then, I walked to Main Post, and I went, uh, did some shopping there, and I stopped at Burger King to grab a burger before I headed back for lunch, and as I was sitting there by myself eating a burger at Burger King, someone walked up to me, and he said, Hi, I'm with the Navigators. Um, we hold Bible studies here on campus, and we were just wondering if you might be interested in a Bible study. And I swear, I thought that guy had angels. I, wing, I didn't know what was going on. It was incredible. I was like, I couldn't believe this guy. Did, did, did God send him? Well, yes, he did. This guy had no idea he'd been sent by God, but he did. And I can honestly tell you, uh, that that was a spiritual turning point in my life. There were a number of turning points in my life along the way, but that was a moment in history, and in my history of a time I can remember, I will never forget, where someone was present when I was spiritually seeking and brought, think, brought truth into my life. They basically invited me to church, and it led to something uh, that is still ongoing today. This guy, again, had no idea uh, that any of this was going on with me. He just was obediently going around and inviting people to go, and he walked up to someone who was seeking. And that will happen to us sometimes. We're not always going to know what's going on, but we have friends, we have co-workers, we have family. When we are present with them, when we're paying attention to them, when we're getting our mind off of ourselves and onto them and how they feel once in a while, we can notice these things, and we can be present and bring that kind of thing into their life when they need it. It's a powerful thing. I cannot overestimate how important it is. I want to challenge you guys this morning to be present with the people around you, to make friends, and to pay attention to people. People are seeking, but once the seeking process begins, there is also the process of deciding where to go, okay? So this is the next question. How do people select a church to visit? How do they select it? When a, dis when a person decides that they want to go to church, how do they pick one to visit? Now, this question really matters because there is a tremendous amount of options to choose from, if you stop and think about it. If you stop and think about it for a minute, there are Catholic churches, there are Eastern Orthodox churches, there are mainline Protestant churches, there are evangelical Protestant churches of various denominations, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Anglican, Methodist, Baptist, Mennonite, Church of God, Assemblies of God, non-denominational, and many of these churches have subcategories, you know, there's um, PCA and PCUSA, and there's Free Methodists and United Methodists, and there's just, the list goes on and on, I hope you're seeing that, and even in there, um, in the quagmire, though, of all that is the Christian Missionary Alliance. And most people I've found have never heard of the Christian Missionary Alliance. Have you noticed that? I work at Wegmans. You guys know that. I've been doing that for a year. I talk to people all the time. That guy right there, I met him at Wegmans. Sorry about, sorry about that. Um, his name's Alan, by the way. Sorry about that. Um, I talk to these people. And they say, what church are, are you with? And I say, I'm with the Christian Missionary Alliance. You know what they always say 99.9% .9 of the time? What's that? <laughs> Never heard of that before, you know? It's, it's just a reality. So there's all these churches in uh, various shapes and sizes, and many of these churches have, uh, you know, there are large versions of them and small versions of them, and there's contemporary and traditional. And my point in all of this is, is that the options for churches are literally overwhelming. And with this in mind, where does someone without much experience in church begin? And I don't think those of us who are inside church looking out really appreciate how much of a challenge that might be for someone 
to not even know where to begin. As I was sharing earlier with you about when I began to seek spiritually, I didn't know where to go. You'd think I would. There's churches on every corner, but for me, the, the options were so overwhelming, I didn't even know where to begin. It took someone entering in and helping me, providing some guidance to bring me along. But most of the people out there are facing the same kind of thing. There's so many churches out there. Where do I even begin? How do I go about it? And so there are three main factors that influence a person's choice of church to visit. First is affiliation, okay, and which is what we just talked about before. We mean the organization and denomination the church is associated with. A person is most likely to begin their journey towards a new church home with the denomination they are most familiar with. It's what they know. It's just how people work, as unspiritual as it sounds. Bear with me as I say this. Brand, brand loyalty is a thing. Uh, it, it, it's, just, it's just the way people work. It's what we do, okay? For example, people often buy Chevrolet trucks and cars because they were raised driving a Chevy, you know, or people drink Folgers coffee because they were raised drinking Folgers coffee or Maxwell House or whatever, or they drink Tim's because they were always drinking Tim's or Duncan. Yeah, that, see, this is where we start getting into home and getting some of the uh, rivalry going there. But in the same way, people will tend towards visiting a Catholic church if they were raised Catholic or a Methodist church if they were raised Methodist. Does that make sense? They're going to go with what they're familiar with. That's just the way our brains work. It's normal. There's no sense arguing with it or fighting against it. It's just the way people are. This is a reality we need to understand. And there are many, many people out there who wouldn't initially consider visiting a Protestant church because they were raised Catholic. And among those who are open to visiting a Protestant church, there are many who wouldn't initially visit, consider visiting us because they've never heard of the CMA. You know what I'm saying? They're, they'll pass over all of that simply because they've never heard of us. And there are many people that would never even consider initially going to a Protestant church because they were always Catholic. That's just not something they would initially consider doing. So the pull towards affiliation is a big thing. And it works against us in the CMA unless the person uh, visiting has had some experience with us in the past. But because we're a relatively small denomination, most don't. And so it does work against us a little bit here. However, there's good news in that there's other factors that help us overcome this setback. The next factor is impact, okay, impact. By impact, we're referring to how a church may have already touched the life of someone who is seeking, okay? Questions that we would ask would be like, did the church host an outreach that they attended and enjoyed? Well, that's impact. They may have been there for that reason, and so when they think church, they think of that place where they had that good experience. Or did the church's pastor officiate a funeral for one of their friends or loved ones or such things as that? And do they receive online teaching from this church? Another way the impact comes, probably the most common way. If the church has already impacted them in some way, then it will move up in consideration even if it's not uh, an affiliation match. Uh, one of the reasons that most people choose to visit the chapel in this area is simply because of its impact. It has tremendous impact, which is wonderful. Uh, and, and, you know, coming down to home, uh, we've had many people visit our church over the years because they attended Wheatfield Family Picnic or something like that. Sometimes they'll attend the picnic and then show up six, eight months later because that's when they were seeking and looking for a church, and then they'll show up and visit. Impact matters, okay? And the reason that you hear me emphasizing digital options so much over the past couple of years is because I'm aware of the, the potential this has on bringing people in in the long run. Um, it, we have the potential to impact people digitally before they even arrive, and that's huge. It's huge on impact. It's worth the effort, and so that's why you'll continue to see me leaning in on that. But the last factor is recommendation. Recommendation. The recommendation of a friend is a huge influencer on the choice to visit a church. Again, this is just how people work. When people go on vacation, what do they do? They talk to friends. Uh, if, and they're looking for hotel and restaurant recommendations, right? Uh, when they want a car repair done and they're having issues, they're looking for a mechanic, where do they go? Do they go to the yellow pages? Yeah, maybe, but they ask around and say, who knows a good mechanic, that kind of thing. They're looking for a recommendation there. And in the same way, people looking for a church to attend will look to friends for recommendations. And people will often act upon the recommendation of a friend, even if that recommendation is outside of their affiliation and they haven't been personally impacted by it yet. Recommendations are powerful. 
There are always people looking for a church to attend. I know it. I talk to these people, okay? If we recommend our church more, people will visit our church more. It is as simple as that. However, there is another issue to consider. Our goal isn't merely to get people to visit the church. It's to get them to stay, to encourage them to stay. With this in mind, we have to have confidence that people's spiritual needs that we talked about earlier will be met when they visit in order to provide the most confident of recommendations. Deep down inside, the reason that we might be hesitant or even pass on opportunities to recommend from time to time is that we sometimes may feel that their spiritual need won't be met, okay? And so we're going to talk now about what uh, prompts people to return week after week, okay? Not just to come and to visit, but to return week after week, okay? There are two factors, I believe, that affect this decision, all right? The first is community potential, all right? There's some overlap here, but it's important to realize that community potential is a huge factor in whether someone who visits our church will stay week after week. When people come in and visit, they look around the room, and what are they thinking to themselves? They're thinking, are there people here that I can make friends with? Are there people here that I can join and have common ground with in community? If they feel like there's community potential there, they seriously consider coming back. If no, they seriously consider moving on. It's just a normal thing. It's a fact of life. There's nothing wrong with wanting to make friends and find common ground with people. It's normal, okay? And as a small church, this can be a challenging thing, all right? We can feel the weakness. And sometimes in small churches, there can be the temptation to try to compensate for not having that many people in it by being friendly to every visitor, okay? And sometimes I think we can even overcompensate for that from time to time. Have you ever seen that happen? Have you ever visited church and, and had a little bit of, too friendly of a reception sometime? I, I, th I think of the movie Cars. You guys ever watch the movie Cars? Um, and there's that point where they come in those two visitors come into Radiator Springs and they're just like accosted by all these people and all these shops and it just scares the daylights out of them. Sometimes that happens, okay? But it's a very real thing. It's a very real thing that when people come and they visit the church, they look around and they're looking for community potential. And in smaller churches, they can feel a little bit more uh, vulnerable in that area. But this isn't the only factor that matters, okay? There's another factor as well, and that is experience, okay? Experience. Now, there are two ways that experience are considered, all right? First is a matter of style. The first is a matter of style. By style, we are considering how well does the format of the gathering suit my personal preferences, all right? Are things too liturgical? Are things too charismatic? Are the sermons too long? Are the sermons too short? Is the gathering too programmed? Is it too free-for-all, etc.? People like what they like. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, different people have different preferences. They like what they like. Not everyone is the same. It just is, the wha it is what it is. It's not something you can fight, again, fight against. And with this in mind, if they're not comfortable with the format, they may move on even if what we offer is of high quality. It is what it is, you just can't change that. We can't be all things to all people in that way. We're not for everyone, and that's, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We should stri simply strive to be the best version of ourselves and leave it to that. There's nothing wrong with that. But the other is a matter of quality, okay? Quality. And I think this is where we should pay attention a little bit more here, okay? By quality, we're considering how well is this gathering meeting the spiritual needs that I came for? Am I learning new things? Am I increasing in faith as a result of being here? Or is this all stuff I've heard before? Am I being challenged in ways that I can actually apply to my day-to-day -day life? Or is everything being said and done here beyond my comprehension or capability, all right? If a person gets things out of being here, if they walk away and say, wow, that fed me, okay? They will consider coming back even if the style isn't an exact match. But if they are not getting things out of here, if they feel like this is just kind of the same thing everywhere, then they will consider moving on even if the style is a match. Does that make sense? Quality matters. It really matters. I would personally argue that quality is where we have the best chance right now of really just leaning into this and really growing. Um, we will never retain visitors and grow numerically 
if everything we do here is already being done, done other places and done better, okay? And if we take and the things that we do and we strive to do them well and to be the best version that we are, uh, that is just a wonderful goal and opportunity to be setting in front of us for 2023. And with this in mind, I want to challenge everyone this year to find ways to do everything that we do better. And I think what that means is don't be afraid to pick a few things and to do them well, all right? Don't be afraid to think outside the box and to innovate to make this happen. If doing things better means doing things different, then explore it. That's one of the strengths of a small church is you're able to, to explore and to innovate and to, to try things. For me, I am 100% devoted to making the quality of the experience here on Sunday morning to be the best it can possibly be. And that means that we are going to be trying different things this year, um, once in a while, to, to try to make things better. An example of that would be last week, where we met upstairs in a discussion format. Sometimes things are going to go great, and we're going to learn something new. Other times it's not going to work out that well, and we we'll just won't try it again. No big deal. But we have the, the potential to do a fantastic job at everything we do, um, and to le if we lean into that, into, lean into doing everything well. So in a small church, there can be a temptation to throw everything together at the last minute, to, to just keep things going, just try, try to keep the thing moving along. But again, I want to challenge you to let that impulse go. And this year, lean into the idea of doing everything that you do well, to focus on a few things and to do them with the utmost excellence. Do them onto the Lord, all right? And don't worry about it if, there's, if you can't do everything. Do a few things well. So let's innovate this year. Let's build something that we love here even more, and we look forward to coming back to e even more every week. And I think if we do this, the process of inviting others to join us becomes much, much easier. And in the meantime, I want to encourage you once again to focus upon being present out there. All right? Uh, one of the greatest gifts I've had over the course of 2022 was the ability to go and to work outside the church and to be more present out there. I've loved every minute of it, and I would miss it if I wasn't able to do it anymore. Uh, and, and I want to encourage you guys to do the same thing. There's so much opportunity there to be present, to be aware of people who are spiritually seeking, and to introduce God into their life, to be f the Phillips, to the Ethiopian eunuchs. The opportunities are endless Let's keep our ears to the ground and look for opportunities to, br to bring Christ into their life, to be vessels for his use. With that said, let's pray and let's commit the rest of this year to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to serve you. We know that you have us here for a reason. We know that we serve a purpose for your plan, and we thank you for the opportunity. We also know that we in ourselves don't have the power to do it, to carry it out, but we can be vessels for your use. And so, Father, help us to be faithful to the call, help us to be paying attention, and help us to not miss opportunities to be able to represent you to people who are seeking. Help us to be paying attention, and help us to do what we do well. Help us to represent you well, help us to preach your name well, and faithfully, and with good quality, and in a way that honors and represents you correctly. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen.